Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for another class. Uh, today, I have a good word that God's put on my heart today and uh, just awesome how our Father directs us. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I don't know if you'd call it how to avoid a disappointment, but uh, maybe the process of how to remain free from disappointment. And, and I wanted to use an example that uh, probably many of us are familiar with in 2 Kings uh, chapter 5. And if you'll go there, we'll uh, just read that and uh, get started today on this. Um, this is about Naaman. Uh, he was a, um, I, I love the way, I'm going to just start in verse 1. It says, Now Naaman, captain of the hosts of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Interesting. You know, this is God's commentary. He was an honorable man. Okay? Do you know what this guy actually did? He went to Israel and he took captive a bunch of the people from Israel. <laughs> Think about that. That's, that's pretty powerful. That... He is a foreigner, doesn't even believe on the Lord at this point, but he was being used by the Lord to carry away the people uh, of, of uh, Israel. Verse 2, the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Wow, think about that. The innocency of this young little girl who is like so matter of fact about, yeah, we have a prophet in, in Israel and he just, uh, you know, uh, he could heal you of leprosy. You know, and she says it's so matter of fact to the point where it was reported, listen to how it says it. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is in the land of Israel, that uh, is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go, too, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed. And he's speaking of Naaman. And he took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, now when this letter is come to thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. How would you like to get that letter? I want you to heal my servant. <laughs> Can you imagine how the king felt? Well, let's see, let's see what the king thought about that. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man does send to me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, that now he seeketh a quarrel against me. So he thought he was trying to provoke a fight. And so what happened as a result of that? Well, verse 8, it says, It was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him now come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Wow. How do you think uh, Elisha heard that? Yeah, I think the Lord told him, because he sent to the king, and the king's wondering, like, how did you know I rent my clothes? <laughs> you weren't here. You know, think about that. See, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, and neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. And what I love about this whole story, I mean, it really touches my heart. You know, we, we are taught so much in church that is not true about the Old Testament and about how God was this way or that way. But, you know, God was drawing every single person to him because he didn't want anyone to perish, even what were called the heathens, okay? Think about it. Anyone who didn't believe in the Lord was a heathen, whether you were born in Israel or not. You know what I mean? So I just think this is beautiful, how our Father's heart here is just 
reveals like, hey, I want everyone to be saved, delivered, and set free. Amen? And so it says, um, and so it was, uh, okay, verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses, with his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again unto thee, and thou shalt be clean. Okay, now, what would you think about that? Most of us would be, all right. I have a whole testimony about that. But uh, he says here, he says, um, but Naaman was wroth. I mean, that's like one notch above being PO'd or angry. <laughs> he was like uh, frothing at the mouth. He was, and he went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Wow. You know, we can learn from this, and we are going to learn from this today. Look at his reaction. When he didn't get it the way he thought it should be, what happened? What happened? He was ticked off. He was mad. Do you know, do you know that even though um, it was God's will for him to be recovered of his leprosy, and he really went in faith because he believed the word that his, uh, his, the maid had told him, he thought, wow, this is great. But from the time he heard the word, which she didn't tell him how it would be, she just said, he'll recover you of your leprosy. The enemy painted a picture in his mind of how it should be. Anyone ever feel that way? Like, oh, I should have been free from this months ago. I mean, I believed God, you know, three months ago for this. What's happening here? And it's easy for us to point a finger at God. And really, that's what Naaman was doing, was like, ah, this ain't like I thought it was going to be. So the point I want to make is that so many of us, we hear about the Lord or we're raised about the Lord, you know, raised in the Lord, and uh, we hear about His power. We read the testimonies and the miracles in the Bible, and we think to ourselves, wow, you know, when we finally accept that healing, just for example, since we're talking about it, healing is available to us, you know, we, instead of just accepting like, you know, like Jesus said in the garden, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done, you know, where our heart is just open to whatever our Father has prepared for us and just to receive it as it's recorded in his word, all of a sudden we have all these other thoughts come into our mind about the way we think it's going to be. In fact, many times people will go to a certain place or they'll hear about a certain you know, conference or this or that, and they'll go there in hopes that it's going to be a certain way and they're actually setting their heart up for the potential failure that they could because they have an expectation that was not sown by God. In other words, it's like the old, uh, the saying, you know, you get a word from God and you turn it into a paragraph, you know, you've all heard that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but did God write that paragraph? If he didn't write the paragraph, we're adding something to what he said that if it's of the flesh, it's going to be a limitation for us. Amen? And we don't want that in our life. Instead of, instead of what would have been best for Naaman to do is when he heard this was just say, wow, I don't know how it's going to be. I can't wait to see the prophet and see what he says. But he didn't. He had this, and he says right here, I thought surely he would come out stand over me, call on the name of his Lord, on the Lord his God, and put his hand over the place, and then boom, the leprosy would be gone. Whatever gave him that idea? Or maybe I should say, who ever gave him that idea? You know, that's what the devil does. And sometimes he'll even use the word of God, our familiarity with the word of God, to 
paint a picture in our mind that can actually hinder us, can turn into discouragement and disappointment to us. You know, I'm going to give uh, one uh, just testimony of how this happened in my life. When I was very sick and I thought I was doing everything that God wanted me to do to be well um, and wasn't getting well, and one expectation after another I was disappointed with, one after another. And, you know, I knew what the Word teaches about having a uh, positive imagination. So anything that I heard in my ear, had a dream about, or someone spoke about, or a vision by hearing some people talking, I thought those were all from God because they showed me well, doing the things I did before. So I'm thinking to myself, well, all of those are from God. This is how it's going to be. But what did it do? Although, although it was God's will for me to be well and that I was already healed, I mean, I was already healed. So every one of those visions and all of those expectations were not present tense. They were all in the future. You know, that's the trouble with most prophecies today. They're putting your miracle, your deliverance, uh, your activity off into the future sometime. And when is that future going to happen? That's what happened here. When, when Naaman, he had an expectation that was good, that God sowed into him by him listening to the little girl. But what did he do with that? What did he do with that? He added to it. So the enemy used that to actually divide him away from actually receiving what the Lord had provided for him. Now, I had the same exact thing happen to me. I had a brother in the Lord who um, he called me and he told me that he had a vision from God. And in this vision, he said, um, I was at our church property and he said that our pastor spit in the dirt and made a clay like a mud out of the dirt from the property and he put it on my chest and I went and washed at this place in the, at the property and the tumor just went away. And so I'm like, yes, <laughs> I'm ready for that already, okay? So I called the pastor. Well, my friend uh, had called the pastor before he called me. And he told the pastor the vision. And then the pastor, uh, I don't know this detail. I never got it from either one. But I believe he, he, uh, the pastor said, you can tell Mike. So he called me and he told me. Well, when I called the pastor to see if I could come over and get that to happen, the pastor said to me, he said, you know, Mike, I don't get a witness that that's from God. Can you imagine how I felt? I was so disappointed. I said, are you sure? It's like, why did you have him? I didn't say this to him, but I'm thinking, why would he have, you know, called me and, and uh, told me that if, if the pastor had told him that it wasn't of the Lord? You know what I mean? And so anyway, uh, you know, needless to say, I argued with my pastor for a little bit about, shouldn't we at least try it? <laughs> you know, and he said, he said, no, he said, Mike, imagine if we were to do this and there's and God's not in it, that's going to really be disappointment to your heart. I said, too late. You know, I'm already, you know, my hopes are dashed. I feel terrible, you know. So anyway, um, I know exactly how Naaman walked away. Now, I wasn't mad, you know, I was just so disappointed. I didn't express anger, more frustration, like, man. And I'm, I know exactly how Naaman felt. But what did I do? See, I connected my heart to what I thought was scriptural because, well, Jesus did it to the blind man and the blind man washed and he came seeing. So why wouldn't that work for me? Okay, well, because God didn't direct it. Somebody of their own zeal and their own excitement had a dream or had a vision and uh, 
they told me. But was it from God? Was it from God? Well, no, my pastor didn't have a witness. And, you know, I trusted that he would have a greater witness than I would. And uh, so I did, you know, not, uh, that was some consolation that he said it, you know. But why, the point I want to make is that Naaman would have never been discouraged or disappointed had he just said, okay, let me wait and see how this is going to turn out. Let me just believe that what this little girl said is true. And that when I meet this prophet, that I'm going to be recovered of my leprosy. Amen? Wouldn't that have been the easy way to do it? Of course. But you know, we, even in this char the charismatic uh, circles that we're in, there's so much emphasis uh, that is placed on, you know, the signs and wonders that we see. And they're promoted in many cases, unfortunately, they're promoted over the Word of God. But yet in, in, uh, in Mark uh, 16, verse 20, it says that the Lord went with them, confirming the Word with signs and wonders following, not the other way around. And so many people watch these, uh, you know, hear these testimonies, they watch or they go to conferences, and uh, they're disappointed because it doesn't happen like they thought, well, so-and-so just went up for prayer and they were healed, and I went up for prayer and I'm not healed. See, the whole thing they're missing is it has nothing to do with what you're doing. It's what you're believing in your heart, okay? So the person who ran up and seemed to be just like you when that minister prayed over them, they just accepted that it was done and walked away. And they were able to embrace the deliverance that the Word declared because they believed in their heart. Another person who says they're just like the other person comes up and their expectation is in whether they feel a change or not. Whether they see a change in their circumstance and when they don't see it, what happens? Well, they're discouraged. They're disappointed. They walk away thinking to themselves, man, God, why not? You know, another, another example was I was in a service when I was very sick and uh, it was during a, a time of praise and worship. And, and this one gal during praise and worship, a young girl um, was diagnosed with some disease that was, you know, progressively just going to, like ruin her life, just cause her to waste away, uh, just received healing, just singing in the song. And, and uh, she was like, you know, weeping with gratitude. And she says, you know, oh, I just felt Jesus touch me and, and I was, I'm healed, you know, and she was so happy. And I'm over there thinking, well, I'm over here. I've been waiting longer than she has. You know what I mean? So instead of being able to rejoice in the word that she believed to receive, I'm still over there with my performance mind thinking, well, why not me? Lord, I've been serving you all this time. I'm the assistant to the pastor. <laughs> you know, that's how we think. And I was disappointed, to say the least. I was disappointed. Instead of being able to rejoice that this girl received healing and deliverance. I was focused on me. And what happened here? N same thing. This expectation that Naaman had turned his focus inward to a way something should be. And it wasn't, when it wasn't that way, what happened? He got mad. He was upset, you know, and disappointed. And, you know, I think that it's so important for us that we don't allow our heart to move beyond what the Word of God is saying. You know, in Proverbs, I'm going to read this in a little bit, but Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says that we should guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Okay? That's very important. 
and he stresses it, you should guard your heart. Why? Because if you let something in there, it's going to affect how things flow out of you and what you're going to be able to receive in the future. So if you have a bunch of stuff in your heart, which I call conditions, and if those conditions aren't being met, then your confidence in the Word of God, which your heart's become connected to in addition to what the truth says, has now divided your heart. And what does it say in James? A double-minded person is unstable. They're not able to receive what God has provided for them. Why? Because God's withholding? No, because they're just not simply believing. They're not being steadfast that what God's Word says is enough. Amen? Amen. So we should let our expectation be the Word of God alone and let that Word build into us a confidence. Let that Word become the meditation of our heart. Let that Word become the truth and that is all we need. Amen? Let, let me, um, like, uh, well, let's go here. Let's go to Isaiah 55. Wait a minute. Hold your place there. Let me finish the story for all of us. We don't want to leave him ticked off. You know what I mean? So, uh, so this is beautiful. Uh, in verse 12, he goes away in a rage. Now, this is, again is beautiful how our father didn't just judge him and say, well, if that's the way you want it, then you're on your own. Have it your way. No. What did God do? Listen to this in verse 13. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. Isn't that beautiful? It's like God gave him an opportunity to change his mind. He didn't just throw him out and say, well, if that's the way you're going to be, then go get your miracle where you can find it. No, he didn't do that. God was so loving and kind that he spoke to his servants and the servants spoke to him. Do you know, we can have that in our life too. You know, if our heart becomes hardened, our father is going to speak to us another way. He's not going to give up on us. So stay in the word because that's what he's going to use to speak to you. That's what happened to me when I realized that I had turned away, so to speak, from uh, what the word said and how it was going to uh, be released in my life. God didn't give up on me. When I acknowledged, hey, I'm wrong, I'm not believing, he pointed me right back to his word. And I had an opportunity again. I could have said, I've already read that. You know, and many people do that. I already know Isaiah 53. I can say it backwards in my sleep, you know. But why would God minister to us if we didn't need it? Amen? He's bringing it to our mind, not because he's patting us on the back. Here's another one you know. <laughs> you know? No, it's because he wants us to hear again something that we are maybe have laid aside or maybe really haven't heard him in. Amen? So uh, notice what he does. He listens to his servants. Do you know how they came to him? They came to him just like our father comes to us, a small, still voice. And they said, hey, father, notice the respect that they showed him. See, these servants themselves believed. They believed too. And, and they're like thinking, wow, how can we get him to do something this simple? So they came and they, they like bowed their knee before him. And they just made a simple point. Hey, if it was something hard, you would have never, ever, you know, grumbled. You would have went and done it. So why not just do the simple thing? Do you know that's how our Father is always speaking to us? He's always pointing us to the simple thing that we are what? Not seeing. <laughs> or we're thinking, ah, it can't be that. That's too simple. True? Yeah. Like, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
How much simpler can you get to be delivered of all of your sin, all of your guilt, eternal judgment by just calling on the name of the Lord because you believe that, wow, okay, I'll just accept what Jesus did. How simple, huh? Amen? Would you stop someone from paying off your mortgage? <laughs> Would you say, no, I, my name's on that loan. I'm paying it off. Or would you say, you want to pay my loan off? Well, go ahead. <laughs> Which would you choose? <laughs> yeah, let's go the simple way. And look, listen to what Naaman did. It says, then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? You know what he didn't do? He didn't say, okay, I'll do it. I'll go in there and dip your seven times. Anyone ever done that? You hear a word from somebody? Sharon, okay, I'll do it. I've already done it, but I'll do it again. We can be pretty stupid, can't we? <laughs> you know, uh, I love this saying my pastor used to say to me all the time. I'm not proud of it, but he used to say to me, he said, Mike, just because you have the ability to be stupid, you don't have to exercise it. <laughs> you know, and we don't have to. But why do we? It's almost like a default for us. You know what I mean? But he didn't do it that way. He heard the correction from his servants. And he said, you know what? You're right. I would have jumped over the moon if he would have said that would have gotten me free from. So why not just go dip in this dirty, muddy river? It's hot out anyway. I might as well cool off. You know, whatever. And he did. He just bowed his heart before what the Lord had told him. And what did he do? He received his miracle, that simple, just dipping in the river. And he says uh, and, in verse 15, And he returned to the man of God and all of his company and came and stood before him. And, uh, and he said, uh, Behold now, I know that there is a God in all the earth, not in, uh, no, in, no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. And he said, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he refused. So anyway, the point that this is making is Elisha just didn't take any credit for it at all. He wouldn't accept any gift at all for what the Lord had done. And wow, that had to speak volumes to Naaman as well. Like, hey, you didn't get this from me. You got it from the Lord because you just believed and acted on the word that you heard. That had to be such an encouragement for an amen. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So how is it that we can keep ourselves from being set up for this kind of disappointment that like Naaman almost fell into to the point where he didn't get his miracle? Uh, go with me to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. In Isaiah 55, it says, I'm going to start in verse 8. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You know, I was taught like, and it, this was quoted to us, you know, in church. Well, who do you think you are that you can think like God? You know, his hot thoughts are so high. And who are you to think that you can walk in his ways? His ways are so much higher than yours. Any, sound familiar to any religious people out there? Yeah, we were taught that. But do you think God is saying, you know, up there with his you know, nose in the air, I'm so much smarter than you and so much greater and better than you. No, he's doing the exact opposite. 
He's trying to communicate to us how we can think like he thinks and how we can walk in his ways. He's not saying, I forget about it, you know. No, listen to what he says, and this is beautiful. He says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Wow. So what he's saying is, look, this is how I'm communicating my thoughts, and this is how my ways work. It's just like the rain that comes down from heaven. His voice or his word is spiritual. It's coming out of the heavens. You know, the a, a place we cannot see where it comes from. But his word is coming to us just like the rain is falling down. But what if you just put a big old tarp, plastic tarp, over your garden and, uh, and caught all the rain so that it wouldn't get your garden wet? What would happen in your garden? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing, it would stay dry, and it would, none of your seeds would germinate and grow. None of them. But God says, here's how I do it. So he said, receive what you're hearing. As it comes down, accept what you're hearing from me. And he said, it's sent for this person, purpose. He said that it's, it's going to make, it's going to make it bring forth and bud. When the ground receives the water, and the, it comes in contact with that seed, what happens? A law that God established, it's going to germinate. And that's what's going to happen in us. If we allow His Word to penetrate into our innermost being, that incorruptible seed that we have been born of, His Spirit is going to bear witness. And when our heart enters into agreement with that, what's going to be the end result? What's going to happen? It's going to bring forth in bud. Is it going to produce something other than what's already been provided for us in Christ? No. It's going to release what has been done in Christ. Now, keep in mind, this was written in Isaiah. And Isaiah is before the cross. So he's sharing this message as something to look to. Okay? Now, we use this same word of truth, and we're looking to what's been accomplished in Christ Jesus. Amen? You know, in uh, Isaiah 53, 5, and a few chapters before this, uh, it talks about, uh, let me just read it since I'm so close. close. Notice what he says here in verse 5. It says, and with his stripes we are healed. Okay, that's present tense. Okay? You received the stripes, you are healed. How did Peter write it? In 1 Peter 2.24, Peter wrote it by whose stripes you were healed. See, Isaiah was looking ahead to the cross, and Peter was looking back to what had been accomplished. So when I'm, what I'm sharing today is the word has already been fulfilled. So the rain that our Father is sending and the snow that comes down, you know, which is His Word, it's to release what's been deposited in us, okay? That's why I use the garden as an analogy. The seeds are already sown, but if you don't receive the Word to activate those seeds, you're not going to get a harvest. True? It takes the, the rain the former and the latter rain to receive the harvest. Amen? And what's that going to do? Notice what he says here back in 55. This is awesome. He says in, uh, let's see. Uh, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. 
it shall not return to me void. Wow, <clears throat> folks, it can't return to him void. But what if you have a black tarp, plastic tarp over your garden? Does that mean his word went void with you? Nope. It just wasn't received to produce the potential that was in the word that he sent to you. It never changes the potential in the word. It only changes us embracing that potential. Amen? Receiving what's able to be released in us. That's awesome truth, folks. And it says, so I got to say this, it's important that God is not the variable, okay? He's, he's already released everything in Christ, and he's just like those servants that Naaman had. He's watering even though we're like saying, no, that's not how it should be. He's like saying, no, 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 listen, this is how it's to be. Isn't that beautiful? And if we'll just accept that and say, hey, okay, yeah, I was thinking wrong. It's much easier than I thought. So the rain is going to keep coming even though you might reject what's been done in Christ because you're not feeling any different, that your symptoms aren't changed. You know, and you're thinking, well, it should have happened when they prayed for me, you know, or I confessed, I rebuked, no mountains moved in my life. Well, maybe it has moved. And the enemy's just choking your chain with those symptoms to make you invite that mountain back. Invite the mountain back? Invite it back. Say, come on back through your doubt and unbelief. Think that's possible? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it happens more often than it should. No condemnation because God's made it so easy. And listen to what he says here. He says, this is how my word works. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It'll accomplish that which I please. And what is his pleasure in that word? We're going to read that in a minute. And it shall prosper in the thing that I sent, where I sent it. Okay? Turn with me. It's a familiar scripture, but let's turn there and read it. It's in Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalms 107. And this is why God sent his word to you. Not to trick you, not to raise the bar another level. No, he sent his word for this purpose. In Psalms 107, verse 20, it says, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. See, that's what his word is always sent to do, to accomplish healing and deliverance. It's never sent to push off the deliverance. It's never sent to send you on a wild goose chase. God's word is, isn't that at all, because as Jesus said, the words that our Father is speaking unto us are spirit and life. There's no runaround in spirit. There's no runaround in life. And when we, you receive that into you, it can only bear one crop. That's more spirit and more life. There's no death, destruction, or loss in the words that God is sending to us. None whatsoever. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. You know, he sent that word to all of Israel. But was all of Israel healed or delivered? No. Why? Because, as it says in Hebrews, when that rain came down, they didn't mix it with faith. In other words, they didn't remove the tarp. Instead of saying, wow, here comes the rain. Let's remove the tarp. I want to soak it all in. What'd they do? It says, through unbelief, they wouldn't accept the word that he was saying. Why? Well, they're another good example of having an expectation. They thought, okay, we're moving and we'll be there in how many days? Okay, two weeks we'll be there, we'll set up camp, everything's going to be great. They had that in their mind. God said, look, I'm taking you to a land flowing with milk and honey. If he would have told them that, hey, 
But there are giants in the land. There are people that we're, we're going to have to destroy and move out. What would they have done? They would have said, we like it here in Egypt. It's beautiful. <laughs> Making bricks isn't that bad. Yeah, we'll, we'll get the straw too. Yeah, no. So God knows what we're able to bear. And he's not going to raise the bar for us, but he's going to encourage us and Little by little, he's going to sow this into our hearts. Amen? To where we too can say, hey, yeah, Jesus has done it. I don't need to put up with this. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. I was made whole by the stripes of Jesus. And your expectation will be, well, if God said it, it's not my job to do it. He said, he sent his word and he hastened to perform it. In uh, the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, he says, he says there that anyone that has the spirit dwelling in them, it's through that spirit that he gives and preserves life. He does the giving and preserving, not us. Our part is just to receive, just to cooperate just to accept that it has been accomplished in Christ. How simple is that? How simple is it just to go wash in the Jordan, dip seven times? Why not just dip in the Word until that has washed you clean to where your heart is, has no expectation other than Jesus did it, it's fulfilled, it's done. That's simple, amen? That's the way it should be. Jesus did it all. That's why Paul said in, um, in Galatians chapter 2, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's like, it's already been accomplished. So I'm not even out there having to get this, all this faith, I got to build this all up. No, 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 no. I'm placing my faith in what Jesus has already accomplished through his faith. Amen? How simple that is. Amen? That's what our Father has accomplished for us. And we, through the Word of God, can just choose to rest in it. When Peter said, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that ye, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Is that something that's one day will happen to us? And what's the condition for it? The same condition for accepting who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Do you know there's very few people that once they hear that message, they'll, they'll like, wow, you mean he died for my sins and all I got to do is call on the name of the Lord and I'll be saved? And they get saved. And it's that simple. They don't ask what they need to quote or memorize for six weeks or what mountain do I got to speak to? And they don't go through all that. But I'll tell you what, the minute they get a symptom in their body, they're asking everyone, what do I need to do? Instead of saying, wait a minute. If I receive the first part of this verse and know that it's true, then the second part must be true. And if the second part's not true, then the first part's not true. And I got more things to worry about than just being sick. <laughs> you know, think about the simple logic in that. Amen. But do, but do we allow our mind to go there? No. And it's by intent. The devil, just like with Naaman, doesn't want you to see the simplicity of just, hey, whatever he says, just do it. It's the enemy who's raising the bar for you. It's not our Father. He sent his word to heal you and deliver you from your destruction. He didn't say, if you do X, Y, and Z. No. He said, my son did that. You just accept what my son did. 
How simple is that? You know, you received Christ as your Savior. What race did you one run to win that? What mountain did you climb to receive that? How much, did you spend, how much time did you spend confessing God's word for before you received Christ as your Savior? Why would you think any other promise that he has given you would require that? You know, you know many people have an answer for that. <laughs> But it's not the right answer. You know why they have an answer? Because they've been taught that in church. They've been given the 10 steps to healing. Okay? You know, the first nine steps are casting down everything you thought was necessary. <laughs> the 10th step is just, okay, I accept it, Jesus. <laughs> it's that simple. Amen? Why do we turn it into... I don't know what you'd call it. We, we, we create our own mountain. Yeah. We create our own mountain and then we can't even remove it. But it's so simple. So how do you make the decision to not set yourself up for disappointment? How do you, how do you what do you do to to, you know, like nip that in the bud, to keep it from turning into something. You don't let your mind or heart receive anything more than what the Word says is true about you. See, the devil might show you, let's say you're sick in bed right now, and you're feeling very weak, and you have a picture in your mind about yourself out picking flowers and running through, you know, the sound of music or whatever. Okay, you get that picture in your head. That's future tense. When are you going to see that? Just say, wait a minute, devil. No, I'm that way right now. And the moment your heart embraces that, you'll get out of your bed because you'll see that it is done. It is complete. That's how simple it is. You won't put it off into the future waiting for it to happen. You know, <clears throat> I'll just throw this in. You know, so many people came to me with dreams and visions they said were of the Lord. And, you know, uh, there would be flowers in one dream. And they say, this shows that in the spring you're going to be, you know, blossoming and brought forth, you know, was one that they, and you'll be free. And I'm like, yeah, but it's the middle of winter. <laughs> I'm not going to wait that long. I don't think I can live that long. But see, did that come from the Lord? No. Today is your day of salvation. Not tomorrow. God's not putting it off or withholding it. You might be in a situation where you, like I was, where I had allowed this to really take over my body to a place of where I was truly uh, weakened and incapacitated by allowing sickness and disease to be there. But once my heart changed, there was a spiritual strength that went beyond my own mental capacity to understand or receive. And that allowed me to walk on. That allowed me to stand up and say, it is written, I was healed, therefore I am healed. And to allow that to be my strength, even in the midst of the storm, even in the midst of my weakness. You know, that's what Paul was saying when he said in 2 Corinthians 12, when the Lord spoke to him, he said, my grace is sufficient for you that in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. And if you have all these conditions, these expectations that have to be met, that's all your strength. Wouldn't you rather trade them in for freedom right now? Just exchange them and say, well, I don't need that to happen to be okay. I'm healed now. I'm whole now. I am free now. Amen? Amen. Praise God. One more scripture. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Don't get stuck on the hope part. 
which is a positive expectation, but let your faith cause you to possess what the hope has painted a picture of right now. Let it be the substance that you hang on to. Don't hold on to the vision or the dream. Hold on to what faith is saying, that it's giving you understanding that goes beyond what your natural mind can comprehend. Verse 3 says that by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God and not by the things which do appear. If we're going to allow our heart to rest in only what we can see, then faith will never have place in our heart to be the substance of the vision or the hope that we or the expectation that we have heard or had been established in our mind or heart by the Word. We have to say, well, the Word is the fulfillment of that expectation. So I receive the Word. My confidence is in the Word. My hope is in the Word. My steadfastness is the Word, which has already been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And if Christ is in you, what more do you need? The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken your mortal body by His Spirit that dwells within you. Leave God to do what only God can do, and you just rest in what He has said is enough for you. Just like Paul said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Wow, how simple. Amen? Well, thank you all for joining me for this class. Um, Please tune in again and uh, for another good word. God bless you.